Good morning. This is Bill Kelly, co-founder and president of Bioinformatics LLC, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on content marketing and the transformation of life science marketing. I am joined <coughs> this morning by Dr. Robin Rothrock, our director of publications who also served as lead analyst on this report. As some of you already know, Bioinformatics LLC is a market research and advisory firm that focuses exclusively on the life science market. We survey scientists about their product usage, preferred suppliers, and their unmet needs. This information is used by our clients to support new product development and market entry decisions to create new brand and positioning strategies and then a host of other ways whenever customer opinions are an important factor to be considered. While most of our work is in the form of custom research projects, we also publish off-the-shelf reports from time to time on subjects of general interest, and today's presentation is based partly on some recent research. Our latest report, Content Marketing and the Transformation of Life Science Marketing, is available now. In this report, we focus on how scientists use and how receptive they are to different digital marketing techniques. To meet our objectives, we surveyed a very large population in the US, Europe, and Asia to understand the differences between regions, market segments, and age group. So let's take a look at the objectives of this research. Life science marketers can't stop talking about content marketing. What exactly is it? Is it the new advertising? Life science suppliers have been creating great content for decades. Websites, manuals, protocols, product selection guides, seminars, webinars, videos, to name but a few. How is content creation and deployment different today? In an era where customers are rapidly taking the lead in the sales process, often completing 60% or more of the sales process before contacting a rep, what can life science suppliers do to influence the decision of which vendor to select? If you search the web, you'll find many different definitions of content marketing, but we like this one best from the Content Marketing Institute. Basically, content marketing is the art of communicating with your customers and prospects without selling. It is non-interruption marketing. Instead of pitching your products or services, you're delivering information that makes your buyers more intelligent. The essence of this content strategy is the belief that if we as businesses deliver consistent, ongoing, valuable information to buyers, they ultimately reward us with their business and their loyalty. The traditional marketing techniques that businesses have used in the past are becoming outdated and uninteresting to consumers, leading to low conversion rates, decreased website traffic, and lower ROI on many companies' marketing spend. Just as general consumers have learned to skip over commercials and to re read magazines without glancing at the ads or to navigate a website without even noticing the banner ads, scientists are also tuning out marketing messages from their suppliers. That's not to say that content marketing replaces all traditional techniques. Far from it. Content marketing amplifies and enhances your traditional marketing. As our friend Guy Page at Pacific Biomarketing likes to say, it's more than the four P's of marketing, price, product, promotion, and place. Marketers are challenged as never before to connect with scientists, capturing them intellectually while resonating with them emotionally. Content marketing ideally leverages the benefits of marketing automation with various digital media channels to establish and reinforce customer relationships. Robin? Thanks. Okay, we've talked about the way consumers in all markets are tuning out the flood of marketing messages they're exposed to each day. And we know that the web has for a long time enabled small competitors to get noticed and to appear much larger than they are. We also know that scientists often focus their research on narrowly defined goals, making it difficult to segment the market based on the shared needs of different groups of researchers. 
And when it's difficult to segment a market, it is equally difficult for your messaging to resonate with potential customers using traditional broad-based marketing techniques. Content marketing is not about reaching out to these sub-segments of the market. It is all about enabling them to find you. And it appears in the life sciences it's working. As you can see here, 48% of scientists report they are relying <clears throat> more on content to support their research. This isn't because they've become more curious than they were last year. It's because there is more information out there and it's even more accessible than ever before. It's especially interesting to note that our data show that the younger scientists who are earliest in their careers are even more reliant on online sources of information than their colleagues. While this may be attributable to their relative lack of experience, it may also be partly explained by the fact that these digital natives are more adept than their older colleagues in searching for information. Life science suppliers were among the first in any industry to leverage their websites to engage their customers and have always recognized the importance of strong technical content. As this slide shows, most have also made their websites easy to navigate. The ease with which scientists find the content they're looking for reflects the intersection between website design and how familiar visitors are with the sites. It's always easier to find what you're looking for when you know where to look. On average, life scientists currently spend about 15 hours each week accessing content related to their research. This amount of time is consistent with that which we re was reported to us in 2013, suggesting that researchers may be reaching a plateau as to how much time they can invest each week online to remain current in their field. A few other couple points I'd like to note on this slide. Researchers in the rest of the world, mostly in Asia in this study, spend the most time reading content to support their research. Younger scientists, those 40 and younger, also spend more on time online than researchers more established in their field. Those working in industry, primarily pharma biotech in this study, spend fewer hour hours accessing work-related content than their colleagues in academia and government. We tried and we tried to come up with a way to make this slide prettier, but we just couldn't, so I apologize. But I wanted to put this up there to highlight the many forms of, many formats that your content may take. One important aspect of setting up your content marketing campaign is to choose the best format for your content. Choosing the content format requires considerable research to discover what type of content your audience prefers. And at a high level, this is what our report is intended to help you do. For example, an infographic may go a long way when targeting a busy lab manager versus an ebook that is much better suited for a content hungry young researcher. You can see here that life scientists are more likely to share the accepted coin of the realm with their colleagues, publish scientific findings that have been vetted by their peers. Your challenge is to develop other forms of content that explain, enhance, or even challenge what is being published in the literature. The New York Times Insights Group published a study that looked at the key factors that influence people to share content. Unsurprisingly, they discovered that sharing is all about relationships. They outlined these key motivations for people to share. To bring valuable and entertaining content to others. To define ourselves to others to grow and nourish relationships, and to get the word out about causes and brands they care about. Now, if you decide to share a link to this presentation with your colleagues, would you send them an email? 
or would you instead post it to your timeline, dash off a tweet, or put a quote post on Tumblr? In general, the role of email is in flux, particularly as a tool for sharing news. That said, email retains outright advantages over social networks in some cases. Despite Facebook and Twitter's offering of private message services, email remains the standard for private, direct exchanges between small groups of adults, especially for business or work-related communications. Emails also get more attention. You don't see everything your colleagues update on LinkedIn, but if someone you know sends you an email, you're going to open it. On the other hand, there appears to be a generational shift away from email that you need to keep in mind. The New York Times reports that millennials were about as likely to use social networks as email for sharing news. But if you look at even younger people, Pew Research found that only 6% of American teens exchange email daily, compared to 22% who I am, 29% who send social media messages, and 63% who send text messages. In five to seven years, some of these teens are going to be using your products at a lab bench. But at the end of the day, the concept of content marketing is inherently tied to search engine optimization, or SEO. Now, most marketing teams have been engaged in SEO for a long time. What's different now? Google's ever-evolving ranking algorithm has finally come of age and is sophisticated enough to be able to rank sites based on the quality and relevance of their content like never before. We've reached a point where the content that search engines like is largely the same as content that your human vet visitors will like. The days of meta tagging and keyword stuffing are gone. Content marketing is infinitely more than just creating more blog posts, videos, and infographics. Content marketing isn't a subset of SEO either. A strategic approach integrates content marketing and SEO. SEO anticipates demand through an understanding of keyword popularity, and content marketing creates demand driven by producing content that supports the customer journey. This is important in the life science market because because more than 50% of life scientists identify general web search as their number one source of information about products. Given the importance of general web searches when seeking out content about products and services, SEO is critical to the success of any content marketing campaign scientists must be able to find the information that they're looking for when doing a general search. On average, researchers tend to perform long tail searches using three to four search terms per inquiry to increase their chances of generating better, more meaningful results. Unfortunately, only a third can easily find content to make a buying decision. You'll remember earlier we told you that half of all scientists surveyed said that they found it very easy to find content to support their research, but only a third find it easy to find the content they need to make a buying decision. And effective content marketing is ultimately about making that buying decision easier. Here are some of the commonly accepted ground rules of content marketing. So, so many companies are following these rules for creating and publishing meaningful content, which is great, but less effort is put towards initiating conversations with current and prospective consumers. Virtually all interactions are the result of content consumers taking it upon themselves to comment on a supplier's article or ask a question or request customer assistance, or other consumer-initiated dialogue. Buyers are in control. 
but are you prepared f with an answer that will begin a two-way conversation? Moreover, are you immersing yourself in the content that your customers are producing and initiating a dialogue with them? At the end of the day, content marketing must support defined business objectives. Brand awareness or brand reinforcement is almost always the first thing that is thought of when you look at content marketing. The goal may be that you are just trying to find a more effective way than advertising to create awareness for your product or service. And content marketing is a great vehicle for this goal because if you set your con it, because if your content is perceived to be valuable, it's a great way for you to start driving engagement with your brand. With your brand. This is the long-term strategy. Marketing departments have always monitored the conversion metric. How you define a lead will vary, but from a content marketing perspective, this is where you have, through the exchange of engaging content, Encourage someone to give up enough information about themselves that you now have permission to market to them. This can include signing up for a demo, registering for an event, or subscribing to your e-newsletter. Once you have the prospect's permission, you can use content to help move them through the buying cycle. In many cases, life science suppliers already have substantial content that demonstrates thought leadership. This is where, as marketeers, we have traditionally focused the proof points of the sale. Examples include literature citations or case studies you send to your prospects that illustrate how you've solved the problem before. How well are you using content to create value or reinforce the customer's decision after the sale? This goes beyond the user manual, the protocols, and the FAQs on your website. How can customers get the most out of your product or service? And just like you have a plan lead nurturing prospect process to turn prospects into customers, you also need to plan a customer retention strategy. Throughout each stage of the customer journey, figure out which specific pieces of content will cater best to the needs of the different types of customers you serve. In this slide, we listed very generic stages of a sales cycle that's common for most scientific customers and examples of various types of content that can be used. Your version of these arrows are probably much more detailed. The earliest stage of the journey is where you can be really creative and helpful. Write about the latest industry trends, discuss best practices and lessons learned, and identify real challenges the visitor is likely facing without being over salesy with your solution. Once they're a little bit more serious about a potential purchase, buyers want to know their options. They can find listings from an industry pub, buyer's guide or consumer review blog, generic Google search, or you could provide that comparative information for added helpfulness. Content at the buy stage must be personalized. It must validate the decision to purchase and should continue to foster a real relationship with new customers. And finally, continually nurture those existing customers. Content can come from their individual rep or from C-level management to show the customer that he or she is truly valued. In general, here you can see what are the most commonly used forms of vendor-generated content. Protocols and citations have always been important in scientific sales. The challenge for you is to take these newer, innovative marketing techniques to get your prospects and your customers to engage with your core assets. Remember that scientists are also consumers in the broader marketplace, and they are being conditioned to expect to be marketed to in ways they find valuable. For example, a text alert of a special deal or recommendations for a nearby restaurant. They expect no less from their scientific suppliers. 
So to help you out, we came up with five examples of different forms of content and ask scientists to rank their usefulness at each stage of the customer experience. When it came to, um, when it came to having personalized content to help them find products, 43% of scientists ranked email offers and discounts as number one. Personalized content to help customers make a purchasing decision, 42% of scientists ranked literature citations of research conducted with vendor products as being number one. To help them actually purchase, 33% of scientists ranked a VIP discount valid for a future order as number one. And then finally, the personalized content that will help a customer better use the products they've already purchased, 51% of scientists ranked protocol updates and refinements as number one. Promotion is one of the biggest battles you have to win in this content war, as it is the factor that determines if your voice is reaching your audience or not. There are channels that work with some content that won't work for others, but if you look hard enough, you will find that there are outlets to target that are the right distribution channels to amplify your content. Distribution is a matter of finding a lot of different ways to your con get your content to appear in search results. The more you capitalize on the myriad online channels for distribution, the more you will put your great content in the hands of the potential customers who need it. Distribution is where you get to show your brand's ability to deliver industry wisdom. You have great content, get it out where it can be discovered. Here we see the content formats that scientists use when learning about new products. Again, you see that traditional forms of content dominate. But online, all of these distribution channels can be used to drive traffic to your core assets, such as your website and articles that are highlighting your products. Content can't be measured with a single metric because no one data point can successfully or satisfactorily tell, whether you, tell you whether your program is working or not. Instead, you need to create an array of metrics. Here are four suggestions. How many people consumed your content, measured as page views, downloads, or views? How often do consumers of your content share it with others? Whether you require registration before allowing people to read, watch, or download your content, or whether you're measuring leads generated after content is consumed, this is where we can start to determine whether the content marketing effort is making financial sense. And finally, when it comes to sales, how often do content consumers turn into customers? To answer this question, your CRM must be able to record that potential customer consume content pieces X, Y, and Z. Then, when your sales team turns that prospect into a sale, determine the projected revenue and profit of that customer. The respondents to our survey had a lot to say, and their hundreds of comments are included in the report. Here's just a few that you can take a look at. Sigma Aldrich and Life Technologies are the top two companies that life scientists visit to access online content. Breadth of line, coupled with portfolios geared to the most popular life science products, influences the frequency with which vendors are tapped as a source of online content. On average, each respondent visits approximately 11 vendor websites during the course of a year to read, browse, share, or download content. You can see here that there is quite a bit of a gap between what scientists are looking for in terms of trustworthiness of content 
and what they're getting from their suppliers. Vendors must leverage content marketing to bridge this gap in trust. Another data point not shown here is that only 17% of scientists are very confident that suppliers will respect and protect their confidential information. The brands that do content marketing better than their competition are the companies that realize at the end of the day, content marketing is all about building trust. Brands that consistently focus on informing their audience about the items they are most interested in knowing about are off to a great start for establishing greater levels of trust. Once informed, it comes down to being more active, more connected, and more available for the customer to learn and find out more. Now don't misinterpret this chart. We are not saying that R&D systems and Agilent are perceived to be untrustworthy brands. Far from it, not at all. Their products are simply less widely used than those of the suppliers at the top of the chart. What this tells us is that scientists most trust the brands that they most frequently use. Now that might seem self-evident, but it speaks to the level of brand loyalty we see in our market. It takes a long time to build trust with a skeptical scientific customer, and the best companies have been working on this process for a long time. It's not a process with a start and a finish. It's ongoing, and content marketing is a new tool to ensure your success. We're really excited about this report and uh, judging by the level of interest and, uh, and, and sales, so is the market. So we encourage you to visit our website and learn more about it. You can download a detailed brochure as to the results. We know that there is a lot of information about content marketing out there. There's training seminars, there are blogs, there are people that are, are definitely making a living trying to instruct you and guide you into how to implement content marketing. But this, is mar this report is about the life scientist. To our knowledge, no one else has gone out there and asked almost a thousand life scientists as to what content they want to consume, how they want to consume it, how they use it based on the sales cycle of buying a scientific instrument or consumable. So that's what makes this report different and how it can inform your content marketing strategy. So again, please visit us on the website or feel free to contact either myself or Robin. We'd be happy to answer your questions about this report or our custom market research services. So again, thank you Robin for your hard work in putting this report together and thank you all for listening. Thank you.